Good evening, everyone. I am Apostle T.B. Walker. I want to take this time to welcome you once again to our Bible study here at Disciples of Faith Global Outreach, where we are reaching the world one share at a time. I want to apologize for yesterday. We had an interview with uh, a Pastor Matthias Thomas yesterday, and I certainly was looking forward to having that opportunity to have this fellowship with him, to be able to just go over and to talk to him concerning some of the things that you know, he's been going through his life and how things have just been operating for him. You know, he's a great, great man of God. And I'm going to be talking to him this week to see if we can get uh, this interview on uh, Tuesday uh, just to make up for that. So I want you to, I really, really want you to make sure that you tune in next week because I'm going to get him back on. And then I've got a, a brother uh, that's going to be on Wednesday that's just going to blow you away for our community influencers. He is... Um, he is a very talented international singer, sings all over the world, is currently living in London right now, and is really, really doing it big on a really, really large scale. And uh, so I, it's been a great, great pleasure for me to really introduce, you know, to my particular platform. I know they're being, they're introduced in so many other areas, but to my viewers and to, to my platform, or to have them on my platform to be able to expose what they're doing is a real blessing to me. But, you know, I'm not here to do promotions. Tonight is Bible study. I'm here to really delve into what we're here to study tonight in this Bible study. So I'm certainly glad to have each and every one of you all that are here. Thank each and every one that's sharing. Hope that you continue to share the videos because that's really important to our evangelistic effort as it pertains to this particular internet side of our ministry. Now, I'm going to get to the book of Genesis, chapter number 5. I'm going to start at verse number 21. I'm going to end at verse number 24. I'm going to be reading this out of the ESV version. And, you know, I found this study to be really, really interesting. I mean, you know, I just thought that just, well, let's get into it. You know, let's dig in together, and we'll get a chance to see what this is, what, what everything is about. Let's, and I'm going to read this in your hearing. Come on. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he, fathered, after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Final verse, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your revelation. We thank you for this time. God, we know it's not an accident that we're here, but God, that this is a divine appointment that we are here, that you've given us each and every week to meet with you, to sit at your feet, and to get your word. So God, we bless you right now for the unfolding revelation, for the magnitude of your revelation, the weight and the might of your word. We bless you. We thank you for all that you're doing. And we know that it is true that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we thank you, God, for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's take a look at this, because this is a part of a genealogy, right? Genealogies are notoriously boring to most people, you know, except for, you know, anthropologists. Anthropologists seem to love uh, looking at genealogies. You know, people who study history, historians, will have a great love of genealogy, but most Bible readers have a tendency to fly over, to flip through genealogies. And we get to this genealogy here, uh, and it's really, really interesting, and I think that without looking at this closely, we can really miss this. It says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Now, if you look at Adam and Seth and Noah, they're the stars here of the, the Genesis era, right? And, and specifically for those who are um, ones who call upon the name of the Lord, those, you know, those spiritual superstars, those patriarchs, of the uh, Old Testament, especially the the, the, the pre-flood world, uh, we had those particular prayers. But Enoch here in this genealogy is extremely important. We find out that at the tender age of 65, he fathers Methuselah. And when you look at this, this is really, really a youthful age. Uh, Methuselah's name is really interesting because it has several different meanings. Uh, one of those is a man of the dart, right? That we, we know that Methuselah is also dealing with the dart, is also dealing with his fierceness. The idea that he is a warrior. But there's also something extremely prophetic in Methuselah's, Methuselah's name. It means that his death will bring judgment. Or when he is dead, it shall come. And when we mathematically, when we do the math here, we find out that according to this very chapter here, Methuselah actually dies in the very same year of the flood. So there was something very prophetic 
in this name. But again, you know, we could pull that out, but that's again, let's we can fly right through that. So let's look at verse 22. It says, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Now, we're in the midst of this genealogy. And, you know, what we get in genealogies are, you know, such and such we got such and such. And he lived this number of years. And then we find out that he dies. And the purpose of the genealogy, especially the genealogy in uh, Genesis chapter 4, leads us down through the line of Cain, right? We get down at the very end to the line of Cain, we get to understand the world and how those that are living apart from God actually are. But then we get this genealogy uh, in chapter 5 that breaks down now this line of men who eventually, after Seth, men begin to call upon the name of the Lord, right? So we get this line that we also can see that the patriarchs are going to come through. We know that Jesus himself will come through this very line. So that by itself is extremely important. But when you begin to look at this genealogy here, uh, you know, there's a, a shift that happens. You know, this verse actually breaks a pattern that we see, the, the mundane, solemn, you know, writing. You can actually see a penman that is sitting there under a hot light making sure, and, you know, this one begot this one, and this name begot this one, and then he lived 400 years, and then he died. And then all of a sudden you see here, and there's no commentary on any of them. Some of the people are not even named. There, there, there are plenty of people that are born here that are not named, but there's general people that are in the genealogy. The oldest children are often named. The, the women sometimes are not named. Uh, so you've got a lot of people that are being born here that are not named, but in the midst of this, it says Enoch walked with God. Now, he kind of interrupts this whole solemn, mundane, regular pattern and breaks the pattern. And we see that this is going to be repeated again in 24. It's so important that it's actually said twice. Now, when you begin to understand what this is, Enoch walked with God. This is something that's extremely important because it, it's not just a, you know, e Enoch is in the presence of God. No, absolutely not. This is someone who is devoted, who is someone who is obedient to God, who has lived a life before God that results in his favor. That's the kind of life that Enoch is living. So when you begin to look at this, the expression, Enoch walked with God, deals with the intimate communion that he actually has with God. It, it, it's more than just standing in front of God. It's more than just walking before God. It's an idea not only of fellowship, but of progress. Enoch is not just, you know, acknowledging God, but Enoch is continually growing before God. You know, when you begin to look at this, you've got a with, you've got a before, and you've got an after. Enoch is walking with God. He's walking before God, and he's walking after God. And when you are walking with God, and you're walking before God, and then the, 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 the after God is after his pattern. I want you to get that. In the midst of a world whose pattern we can see through Cain. Through, and, and when you begin to look at the Sethite line, you don't see some of the superstar things that we see, and this one is the father of this, and this one is the father of that. No, you hear one thing, and, th and then men begin to call upon the name of the Lord, but then you begin to see this man right here, who not only has a moment of worship, who comes like Cain, who comes even like Abel, who comes before God when the time of, of worship is. No, this is not somebody who gets up on Sunday and says, I'm a churchgoer. I'm supposed to be here on Sunday. Listen, it's Bible study night. I'm supposed to be here. No, this walking with God is not someone who's doing what they are obligated to do. This is someone who actually has God and literally is walking with God in various areas. Well, all the other scenes of his life. There are some of us who walk with God in certain scenes of our life. God is with me when I'm here. You know, listen, I've got so many problems. I'm sick right now. So we were walking with God. You know, I love God. So therefore, it's, you know, Sunday. You know, it's a time for worship. But Enoch looked at God. Remember, he's walking after God. So when you walk after God, not only are you looking to pattern your life after God, but you are also discarding 
old patterns. Listen, there are people right now who think they're walking after God because they're learning more about Him. But the more you learn about Him, your trash can should be more should be full of you. The, the more you walk after God, you ought to need like I mean, you you ought to need somebody to come in and with, with a bin like a hoarder throwing more of you away so that God is at, the, the more you see his pattern you really are supposed to be more convinced that your pattern is a pattern of destruction in a, now when you begin to look at what it says even in Hebrews later it says and Enoch was well pleasing to God get that this was not Enoch loved being around God this was God being pleased with Enoch because Enoch was looking more like him every day. Enoch was not looking more like his daddy. Enoch was not looking more like a superstar. Enoch was not looking more like, you know, a mogul. Enoch was looking more like God every day. Listen, that's the goal of those who walk with God. The goal is not to be with God. The goal is to be like God. The goal is to look at him and say, listen, I'm going to share everything in me that's not like you because my goal in life is to be like you. Listen, they knew it, you know, with Mike, be like Mike. And, you know, people knew that. Basketball players shared old ways of shooting to be like Mike. I remember there were people who, you know, one of the ways you know in basketball that having a, 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 your, your elbow out away from the basket is one of the most negative things that a shooter can do. But I remember there were shooters that were so good out of Georgetown, and they would, you know, when they and, and they, they they threw it up and they would start shooting. And people who could shoot, people who were who had the elbow facing the goal, who could shoot, begin to take and literally throw that style away that was working for them, and literally now begin to put their arm out because that famous person that they wanted to be like, they begin to imitate. Enoch is pleasing to God because he imitates. Now, again, let's look at Enoch here because this is really important. And don't forget, if you have any questions, throw those in the comment. But, you know, and I'm sure as you look at this, it's like, well, what am I going to get out of this? This is nothing. But let's check this out because we're finding a little bit more out about this man who's walking with God that where there's really scant details, but the details that are there, though it may take a little detective work and, a, and you know, and a little insight, I think we've got that. I think we've got enough juice to be able to look at that. Let's check, let's check this out. And, and after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, he had other sons and daughters. Okay, so I, I kind of broke that sentence up. So what do, we, what do we have here? Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah, right? That, and, and he walked with God for 300 years, and we know he had sons and daughters. Now, later on, we'll find out that he dies at 365. So we can mathematically kind of look at this and begin to see what happened. It appears now that Enoch begins a 300-year walk with God after the birth of his son, Methuselah. Now, we don't know what the first 65 years were like, but I can tell you this. They were not spent in fellowship with God. That clearly, we know by what's written here, is that he starts this walk after the birth of Methuselah, which happens at 65. So, he's not born, you know, this would be lovely to kind of think that like, he comes out of the womb, and that he's really this pious guy, and that, you know, he's loved God since he was a child. And that those are our, that, that's wonderful, that's kind of how we really, really look at it, but now the reality is is that Enoch, we can actually see the moment where God is now saying, he's walking with me. Now, if he had been walking with him all before this, he would have never said, after the birth of Methuselah, he's now walking with me. Before this, he wasn't walking with God. The moment God says he's walking with me is an indicator by itself, by the language that he wasn't before this, that who was he walking with? He was walking just like anybody else. And when you begin to look at this, there is a change that obviously happens in Methuselah, but the change that happens in Methuselah is not instigated by, Meth I'm calling Methuselah, in Enoch. Methuselah is the son. There's a change that happens in Enoch, but, but that change is not instigated, nor is the power or the source of that originated in something that happens in Enoch's heart. It's originated by God. You know, one of the most interesting things you see here is one of the tools that God uses to bring Enoch to him. What's it say? 
after the birth of this child, how often is it that, you know, how often is it that people will look back and reflect? And it was like, man, when they were born, I, I mean, I got some things together. You know, it was the birth of this child that led me to start looking at my life and looking at the kind of example that, you know, that, that I was. You know, sometimes what God will do is when you're at your most irresponsible, here's what God will do. He'll give you some responsibility. You know, I mean, I'm talking about like major responsibility. Sometimes you'll get a person who is at their lowest point. I mean, the worst time ever. And you are thinking, God, I know what you're going to do. You're going to bring them some money. I know what you're going to do. You're going to bring a house there because they're out there homeless. God, I know what you're going to do. You're going to bring a rehab. You know, Lord, you might even bring a prison sentence and clean them up and straighten them out. And sometimes God will bring a baby. Sometimes God will bring a living child that, that a person will look at and say, there's no way you are worthy of holding a child. And that person has no idea that God has actually sent a gift of change and transformation. It was after this time. You know, God has often worked through families. He's done it in the past. He will do it even now to call people to himself. So he uses now this child and something happens to the heart of Enoch at the birth of Methuselah. Something happens to him. And it happens at a rel relatively young age. It happens, it happens at 65. Now, you know, to us now, you know, that's not a spring chicken. You're almost at retirement age now. But when you look at how long they lived then, he's practically a baby. There are people who like, and he begot him at 500. You know, and this one begot him at 365. You know, and like, you're, you're you know, you kind of waited a while at 187, 175 when you begin to look at the numbers. But like he's a kid, he's a baby. And so he's having a child here and God is now bringing him around through this child. So that first tool that he's using is now this child, right? But then there's another tool that he uses and, and the other tool is his gift. God begins to activate the gift that's in him. At the birth of Methuselah, Enoch's special gift, is the gift that he has is, is not only an awareness of God, but it's an awareness that judgment is coming. Again, and I'm, I'm going to prove this to you because I want to give you a scripture that allows you to be able to see how impossible it would be for him to know what he knows. Even in the naming of this child, when he dies, it will come. At his death, Judgment will come. Look at that. How could he have known? We understand that God now speaks to Noah and tells Noah about this judgment that's coming. But now, let, let, let me get this. Because in truth, I want you to understand who Enoch is. Enoch's a prophet. Listen, here's what Jude chapter 14 tells us. It, it, and I want you to get this. And because this is really, really important. Something begins to happen to Enoch's vantage point. Listen, you know, the amazing thing is you will find out that the Lord took them up. And, and, and John it was in the spirit of the Lord's day, and, and he took him up. And, and Paul talks about being taken up and in the whirlwind. And when you begin to look at, uh, you know, the transfiguration and being taken up and Moses going up to the mountain, there's something about a vantage point. Every now and then, the reason why you can't see what God's trying to get you to see is that your positioning is off, that you don't have the right vantage point. You know, there are people that are in very difficult survival positions and, and they don't really know where to go. And one of the crazy things you'll see is they'll climb a tree. You know why? Because now I need to see what's out there. Where I am can make me think I'm stuck. Where I am can make me think that the problem is insurmountable. What I'm seeing at my level, at my vantage point, can make me think I'm lost. But if I climb a tree, if I get up higher than where I am, I might find out I'm only just a mile away from help. There's water over there. There's food right there. And now I know which direction to go. Enoch, now that he is walking with God and God has activated something in his heart through his child, the prophetic gift that's in him now begins to manifest. Jude uh, 14 through 15 tells us that Enoch was a prophet. Now check this out. It says Enoch. The seventh after Adam prophesied of them. He's talking about these men who are puffed up, you know, who are evil and who are going to face judgment. And here's what Enoch says. He says, look, the master comes with thousands of holy angels.
to bring judgment against them all, convicting each person of every defiling act of shameless sacrilege, of every dirty word that they have spewed of their pious filth. Another um, translation says, look, the Lord comes. Now, Enoch is not talking just about the flood, but Enoch is prophesying about a final judgment that has not even occurred in our lifetime. Enoch is a prophet. And one of the things that you begin to see is that when God, when he begins to walk with God, one of the things that happens is his gift is sharpened. You know, iron sharpens iron. Listen, if you walk with somebody powerful, you are bound to be more powerful. What happens when you walk with God? What happens to your, your sight when you walk with God? When, what happens when you are shedding you and trying to be more like God? You see like God. He saw past his time. He saw past his son's time. Methuselah lives longer than anyone else, and he looks past Methuselah, but even in this 900 plus year life of Methuselah, that his father will not see much of, not even, see, you know, won't see a third of. Here's the thing that he knows. I'm going to name you this, that when you die, it's going to come. That's an amazing thing about this person who has not been told, we, we don't know anything about him. So when you look at verse 23, it says, uh, so all the days of Enoch were 365. Enoch's lifespan is the shortest recorded of all the patriarchs in this, in this book. Of all. I mean, the youngest person listed in age at this point, up to this point, has been 895 years old. They have lived to 895. So at only 365 years old when he dies, um... You know, and he's in a family with long lifespans. So when you look at this, comparing this to the other patriarchs, his short life would have actually looked like a, an area of divine, um, you know, in some ways reproof, that there would be some divine displeasure that God is actually showing by taking him away, by, 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 by causing him to die at such a young age. But, you know, Enoch doesn't die at 365. And that's the thing. That's why this next... Scripture is so important because you've got this person who lives such a short life. But look what he does. The, the issue is not the length of his life. Look at the power. And for 300 years, what, what Enoch shows here is that he grew for 300 years. He doesn't just know God for 300 years. He grows in the Lord for 300 years. God is so pleased with Enoch. They develop such a, 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 a friendship that in verse 24 it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Wait a minute. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found. This is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Let me give you that again. By faith. Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Listen, I want you to begin to see this. He, you, I, first of all, you can't walk with God apart from faith. That's one of the things that you need to understand. You can't walk with him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? So it's impossible to have a pleasing relationship with God without faith. This was not just a cool guy who God just liked. And this was not a cool guy who just liked God. This was a person who had faith in God. Do you know how many people like God today? Do you know how many people who claim to love God but put no faith? Enoch invested his faith in the Lord. And was pleasing to God. And the Bible says, listen, this wasn't just, you know, just some momentary thing. It says, here was his testimony that he pleased God. Listen, how many people want that to be their testimony? You know, as, as Christians, we would all raise our hands because that's the right answer. You know, you said, who wants to be blessed in the house? Everybody's going to raise their hand because that's the right answer. You know, it's not about money, is it? Uh-uh, no way. And that's, that's the right answer. So we know the right answer. But I want you to really look at this and ask yourself, you know, when was the last time when you looked at this, what testimony you wanted? And there's so many of us that are working like dogs because part of the testimony is that I left an inheritance for my children. That's a testimony. I was a good father. I was a good husband. That's a testimony I want to leave. Listen, when we think about this, we think about the testimony. In some ways, it is our obituary. 
you know, when you really, really understand the, the human mind, we really are not thinking about what God's going to say. We really are thinking about what people are going to say at the funeral. Listen, I mean, I'm thinking about how many people are going to be there, and what do you want people to say? And listen, we're kind of taught that. What do you want people to say when you're in that casket? What are people going to say about you? You need a church home because when you that, when you are dead, and what you now who's going to bury you? So I, I, everything for us kind of stops at the grave. So our big finale is really the number of people who fall out, the number of people who said he was a good guy. People going to say, man, you taught me everything I knew. You were like a father to me. And those are the things that we're after. Here's Enoch's testimony. God gives us almost nothing about this guy. We don't know what kind of father he was. We don't know what kind of husband he was. I don't know what his wife's name was. He has other sons and daughters. We know that. There's nothing else told about him. Why? Because the in truth, none of the other stuff matters. It's left here. It's only for here. All that other stuff that we want is simply for the earth. It is not even fit for the heavens. Matter of fact, so much of it is not even fit for the kingdom. And so when you look at this, when God burned away everything with his eyes like flame. Here's what he saw, a person who pleased God. And the Bible says, it, and he was not. Listen, it, 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 I want you to get this. It, it seemed like he just simply disappeared, right? He just kind of slipped out of sight. Here's what the psalm says. The psalm says, lo, and I looked, and he was not. And, and the, the phrase, what was not, means that it's clear that Enoch, did not die. Now, we don't know a whole lot about him, right? We simply know that it's God who picked him, who chose to remove him from this earth prior to natural death. So, what do we know about Enoch? Well, we, what we know is, well, it's really not necessarily what's said about Enoch that really teaches us about Enoch. It's really what's not said about him. That before this genealogy, everybody has, and he lived, he did this, and he died. Why? Because physical death was the primary, and physical death was the most obvious sign of the fall of man. Listen, one of the ways we know that you're human is that you die. There's so many great things you can do, but one of the things we know that one day you're going to fall down, and you are not getting up again. It doesn't matter who you are. That's just humanity. And you know, we're always shocked. Not him. But he started in that movie. He, he can't die. He was our superhero. I know he died. And listen, it's crazy because you can be 106 and we still trip out like, what? Not him. Yes, even him. But not this guy. In some way, this in, in, in a very mysterious way, he was taken up. And the Bible tells us here that he is, was. this is God's doing. That the Bible says that God actually took him. He was taken directly out of the temporal world and transfigured into the eternal world. J just like that. He, and just like that. And, and listen, the very same way that we will also be raptured and transfigured from this temporal world into the eternal world, made to live there, alive, even when Christ, for those who died beforehand, they will be alive even at the day of judgment, coming with Christ. The Bible says he's going to come in the clouds and with those saints. So, you know, when Elijah, who is the, uh, the other person that we know that did not see death, was raptured up, right? Elijah comes back. We see him again in, in Matthew and Mark. We see him again in Luke in the Transfiguration, where he comes back in glory on the mount with Christ. So he's alive. And when Elijah was taken up, he wasn't like, he didn't die. He wasn't dead. When Elijah was taken up, he was even used again by the Lord to come back here, even in the time of the Transfiguration. And it is even believed that he is one of the two witnesses that will do miracles in the last in, in the last day, in, in the time of the tribulation. So this is amazing. God took him. Now, you know, there's a sudden withdrawal here. Like, it just, boom, comes out. But when you look at this, there's some time that's in between here. And, and the Bible gives absolutely no details about what God did. It just simply says, yeah, I was responsible for it. I bless who I want to bless. I do what I want to do. This breaks no rules whatsoever. Now, you know, this gives hope for eternal life. This is amazing. You know, because why, why him? You know, well, why Enoch? Why is it so important for Enoch? Listen, it was important in that, in that day. Because God was infusing hope that there is hope for eternal life. 
And Enoch showed that, that there's hope for eternal life for those who walk with God. This was John 3.16, before John 3.16 actually was spoken in the earth. This was God saying, look, a walk with me, you can actually be saved from the sting of death. You can be removed from the sting of death. And you know, I can really get into that, but listen, our Bible study's over. I want to get I want to give you this because this is really, really, I think this is really interesting. Enoch walked with God. We, we're talking about that. And I'm, we're ending with this idea of this guy who has this great relationship with God and he walks with God. And that's that's awesome. And we we know that Enoch has other sons and daughters. But I want you to look at this. I mean, you got this one generation, and we're experiencing this in the world now. So I, I think this is kind of a timely thing to really look at. And there's so many people that are looking at their children and looking at their grandchildren, and they're trying to figure out what in the world is going on because they're seeing kids that are nothing like them. They're seeing, you know, people who they gave birth to, who their children gave birth to, and their children's children. And they're blessed to be able to see them, but their personalities and ways that are nothing like them. Enoch walks with God. And you've got to know that as Enoch walks with God, Methuselah has got to see it. And Methuselah's children have got to see it. And they've got to know it. And when the flood comes, you don't hear God saying, Noah, you and your children and Enoch's children get on this boat because they, they follow the pattern. By the time of the flood, only Noah and his children. It only How many generations does it take to actually turn a family to a godless one? One. Literally, I mean, literally, you can have a godly family and then one, two generations they're removed and they now follow the way. The Bible says that uh, that he had other sons and daughters. And you know what? Though their names are not mentioned here, they are apparently didn't follow the way of the Lord. They didn't follow God. So when you begin to see this flood, they came under the judgment even though their father and their grandfather had shown them the way. You know, I think this is really important that we understand, and I think I think it was Matthew Henry who said uh, that grace does not run in the blood. It's not, it's, you know, we don't transfer it down the blood. And I think uh, another thing that he said that I think was really important, he said a sinner can actually beget another sinner, but a saint does not beget a saint. That's really important. We're born in sin, so whenever you have a child, you can beget another sinner. Every time a child is born, that mother has be begotten another sinner. Every time that child is born, the father has been complicit in begetting another sinner. But because you are saved and you become a saint, you can't pass it along. It's not genetic. It isn't one where because I'm saved, my son is going to be saved and my grandson is going to be saved. No, we can't birth them. Only God can. So it's really important to begin to see that it's important what you do with your life that you can't guarantee what's going to happen after your generation. You know, Enoch was not the start of a great uh, generation. He, his family was not the start of a great godly group of people. It was God simply saying, listen, you can walk in the other way. You can walk in a path that's completely contrary to what you see in the world. You don't have to be like people around you. And if you walk with me, the reward is that I'll take you up and out of this. And the, the issue wasn't that he didn't see death. It was that he saw God. That's the real key. The blessed are the pure in heart. They won't die. No. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Listen, I hope that you're having a, I hope you had a great Bible study. I hope that this was insightful and that you received the revelation that is here on, on this page. We're working on a couple things here. So we're going to get rid of some of these um, 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 watermarks that you may be seeing. But we're trying to make make some decisions here. So uh, don't hesitate, you know, chime in. Let me know what you think. But, um, you know, in terms of backgrounds and all those kind of things, I really want you to chime in because we're really trying to perfect some things. So we're working on some things right now. But listen, be ready because there's a word that's coming on Sunday and we'll be back next week stronger than ever uh, with our, our Tuesday interview and a Wednesday interview and live at five and back at it again next Thursday for Bible study. But I'm so glad you were here with us today. Don't forget, tag your friends, share the video. And we just thank you right now. Be blessed today and have an awesome Thursday.